in Berlin right now I mean I I can't complain because it's I think just how things have been handled it's been really good I feel for all of you over there I, I don't know I've just been following from afar but yeah all my see. friends they're more or less living their lives again so <laughs> I mean still not normal for the musicians but but right. starting to people are starting to rehearse together and yeah great well yeah. To just dive right in, I was wondering if you could just talk to us about where you see your current practice right, right now and oh. the influences that led to it. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right in. That's, that's there it is. <laughs> where do I see my current practice? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Well, I'm just starting actually an ensemble at the moment with some, some friends here. You know, Mark Sabat. Yeah, yeah. And Tioko Slavniks and oh, and and friends Rebecca Lane and uh, people uh, like um, this cellist Lucy Railton and um, and Judith Haman has just joined and Samuel Dunscombe and Michiko Agawa and all these people that just kind of converging into Berlin at the moment. So yeah, that's amazing. Johnny Chang, I just yeah, a lot of people coming together. So at the moment, it seems trying to really work with uh, people to develop something on a, in a deeper way that's uh, sort of away from the standard writing a composition and giving it to, yeah. I mean, though, I mean, that, this is also valuable because it's great that like, for instance, we can connect being in different places. Your question was more about <laughs> so many, <laughs> no. so many ways I could go with that. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a purposely vague question. Yeah. <laughs> but you mentioned trying to kind of get away from sort of the standard routine we would be uh, you, you would be making as a composer or whatnot. I think that relates directly just to the, the nature of your work. When yeah. I hear a work of yours, it, it makes me listen carefully outside the parameters of the work. I, I was just wondering if you could talk about that. I, I see it related somewhat to uh, Gestalt theory and how the totality of how a performance is an, an intersection of the mm -hmm. sort of continuity of life. Yeah, I mean, I think that, well, I guess, yeah, Tani talked a lot about Gestalt um, in the meta meta hodos kind of. But yeah, I really think that, that uh, I was reading somewhere this kind of concept of musicking, like as a verb, uh, maybe that's from a Deleuzian kind of concept, but, or just a human concept of, um, I think maybe why a lot of us are drawn to become musicians in the first place is the act of it. I think the more that we can get into the elements with with each other and, and just being very present where we're at, the, the more we can get to a kind of total shape. I, I find that often the, the standard structure of when you're meeting with an ensemble three days before a premiere or something and you're just kind of meeting for the first time and then and you're sort of quickly rehearsing and it doesn't, I mean, this can also be satisfying in its own way, but it's um, maybe more as so you're just meeting each other, but the actual uh, musicking benefits from a longer term process together, where I, I think that the, the work of the musician is, is just as important as the, the composition or the composer. And if there's a kind of meeting together, then this can create a deeper space. Right. You, you talk about the idea of we're, we're in the stage of the listener's music, right? Mm -hmm. Related to what you just said, it, it brought to mind how the sort of autonomy you give uh, your, your music to the listener, the performer, and to yourself. I'm just wondering how, how you view the listening space as being created within a performance between, between the different the elements, the performer, the listener, the, the space mm -hmm. and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if I can say much, anything very intellectual about it beyond just that, yeah, it's a really important point. Yeah, I mean, just that, that just what you just said, that the listener, the performer, the composer, they're all equal to me, that those three points create the realization of the piece. And um, each of us from our points have a different perception of what's happening. So 
did you find yourself having to fight to have this worldview in a sense? Because, you know, w within standard music education and whatnot, it, we're, we're kind of pushed this model of sort of hierarchies between composer and performer and whatnot. And your music, what I'm so attracted to it is that it completely breaks that down. That's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would hope, well, I mean, I, I feel kind of lucky with the kind of mentors I had in my early 20s. I mean, I, I think that uh, when I was first starting out in the cl more classical system, the hierarchical model was very clear. And that was something that I just didn't want to partake in. So I think by the time I felt confident as a composer, I feel lucky that where I was at, I mean, at CalArts, it was very open. <laughs> so I didn't feel like I had to go up against um, models that were something other than just pure creative roles. I mean, because like for, for instance, James Tenney was just really about finding your own voice and being, doing your own thing in your own way. And you should educate yourself, but that, yeah, you don't have to be limited to what has been handed to you. I don't I, I know, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, it's hard not to think about these kind of, like the colonial perspective at the moment, being in Europe, especially being in Berlin and in this moment in time when we're in this sort of pseudo reality <laughs> or in this epidemic time. And, and then also just with the whole movement that's happening in the US in particular, but all over the world. And it's hard not to just examine hierarchies on a greater sense of, okay, in, the, in our scene in the new music world, where where it gets trickled down from it's specifically for germanic music and and i'm realizing oh wait i'm living in germany right now. and and i'm in a kind of world that sort of believes that germanic philosophy and germanic music and germanic thinking and art are the sort of like top of something but it's it's so obscure and strange because that's not that's actually not reality it's just how westerners have they've just decided, okay, this is, this is reality and we're going to say that this music or whatever is the most important music in the world <laughs> and we're just going to ignore everything else or we're, going to, we're not going to acknowledge the fact that we took this from somewhere else or, yeah, and maybe French music, maybe it's okay, some, you know, like whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm just sort of coming, yeah, I don't know. I've been updating this. I have this resource page on my website that I'm trying, I'm finally getting around to being able to sort of update it because um, it's just, I'm just trying to gather together some concepts around tonality, but from different perspectives around, I mean, specifically extended just intonation, but also just the kind of conceptualizing tonality. And it's amazing how much, uh, it's a bunch of, yeah, Westerners looking to other cultures, you know? Right. How to sort of flip that around and like, you know, we really need to have texts coming from those places that are being looked at and really get the proper point of views <laughs> represented in written form. Because I know like in Indian music, it's, it's just not in the practice historically and to the present day that you write about, like musicologists don't write about, the, I mean, there are musicologists there, but it's not the standard thing. You don't write about music. You, it's more, you talk about it or you sing or you play your instrument. It's an oral tradition. So we have to start thinking about things in a different way. Right. And thinking about your music, especially, you know, your influence from Hindustani music, I, you know, you, you talk about your um, interest in the long introduction, right? And I, I can see this clearly in a work like Three Bodies Moving, where it seems the whole piece is unfurling into this one melody and Again, the different elements of sound are combined into one. The melody becomes the form in the listener's ear and whatnot. So is a work like that a sort of a, a meeting ground for you of sort of different influences? Or how do you filter influence in, into your music, I suppose? Yeah, specifically doing, having to do with the long introduction form. This right, kind of... that, that's one, one example of how... Of... Yeah, um, I think what has drawn me to that form in particular, I mean, I think that that's really particular to Drupad music. And I mean, cause you don't get that in most Hindustani music either. It's more in this one right. practice. But um, with that, I've always been drawn to 
that you have these elements that are constantly being unfolded and you the idea is that the whole form is already there the shape and structure is there but that how you move through it sort of suggests the shape and you and it's only revealed is not the right word but it's you you only start to sense it or to become familiar with it over time as you're unfolding into these corners of it and i guess yeah i've I've been really drawn for a while to this sort of 45 minute range and beyond. I mean, I have pieces that are shorter, but I find I'm most satisfied with time periods that are at least around 45 minutes, just because it gives you enough time where you can really get inside these shapes, um, where, where you can still experience the total form at the same time so that they're both the same thing. Of course, you can, you can also do a lot with only five minutes or something, but um just for me and my own practice i think having to do with specifically with these tonalities you really need the time to listen to them maybe that's that's what it is on the topic of tonalities i i was reading your your 2019 harvard lecture so i'm a pianist and you, you make a point that the, the composer composing at the piano <laughs> Is no, I, I love this point though because I agree. I think the piano is an instrument. It's not the yeah, basis. I mean, it was of, my first instrument. That's what I learned music on. Right. You know, so. <laughs> so maybe this is a, a bit of a personal question, but but how do how do these instruments that are you know unfortunately relegated to this sort of equal temperament world? How how does this fit into your conceptualization of harmony? I guess it's the most unnatural for like woodwind instrument, especially like clarinetists. And um, I think where you have to, any, anyone where you have to think through the temperament of your instrument to then get to the other, so where you always have to think against the fingering or against the, okay, how many scents sharper? Because I think ideally it's great if you don't have to think about sense or you don't have to think about pitch space in a way, if it's up or down, but more how it's resonating in a total way. But of course, certain instruments force you to, think in pitch distance over harmonic distance. Yeah, I think clarinet is a good example and saxophone are, are good examples of where, okay, it's between these two fingerings and I have to lift up or down and then I, and some people, well, they first learn that way, like just a physical, okay, I'm, I've got the fingering down, I've got, and then it's like, okay, they're, they're, they're close to it. And then it start, then you can start to get into the total harmonicity of it. But, um, yeah, for keyboard in instruments, I, for a long time, was only writing for keyboards um, up until I was 22 or three or something like that. A lot of my work was only for, for piano. And then when I started to really dive into intonation, I kind of just uh, let it go. <laughs> but now more recently, I'm sort of wondering, okay, I can kind of come back to it. And uh, I mean, so far it's, been through using it more as a sort of intermediary with um, synthesizer kind of instruments, but then also looking into tunable, easily tunable like harpsichords and things. And there's a project in Basel, for instance. I mean, it's more um, re Renaissance music based project 31, where they're um, looking at historical tunings, but look, looking at earlier keyboard instruments and using those and there, I guess there's an organ there that has rows and rows and rows of different scales that you can then play standard early music repertoire on but um, get it very very precise like all the thirds and everything yeah but going back to your initial question <laughs> your, your question was how do I write for instrumentalists how do you conceptualize these sorts of instruments in your practice it's like like you said you you pushed it aside for a minute but do you still feel as if there are sounds you can compose for the piano. Yeah, I think I, I, I think because it was, um, maybe it was also because it was the instrument I learned, I first learned music on, and then I had to kind of break from it for maybe a decade or something. <laughs> it's taken me a while to come back to imagining the piano as being part of orchestration in, in the world that I'm in. But now I can kind of see it a bit, um, yeah, I mean, I guess more, I guess a few years ago, I, w I wrote this piece with organ. And then what I did was I focused on the Pythagorean relationships and had, well, it was for organ and strings and the strings sort of filled in the sound. And I guess 
I really focused on the timbral shifts between the different flutes and the different um, pulling out different stops, but to accentuate the variations in coloration and, and then how the strings could kind of from behind shape the overall timbre of the organ. So it almost sounds like it's coloring how we're hearing the organ by not using all of the the tones that are present, but using it as more like a framework and um, allowing other instruments to kind of color how we're perceiving it. Because I remember I, I was watching recently this, because um, it, it was a lecture from James Tenney, I'm going back to James Tenney, but um, he was just saying, okay, you play a fifth on a piano, for instance. Okay, it's theoretically it's off, it's not pure. But it's so close that our, our brains will just say it's, it's pure. We, we, we accept in our brains because it's close enough that we, we fill it in as the right information or whatever that is right information, but we, we fill in it as this sort of pure relationship. And I find this really interesting too, where instruments can suggest, like maybe it's, it's kind of false or, some, or theoretically false or something's not quite right or off or not in phase totally but but our brains will will accept it as totally pure like we we create we create it in our own perceptions i find this really fascinating too and i think it's something that i can kind of come back to like looking at instruments that have their own capacities because <laughs> I, I think we we all experience this in, in a lot of repertoire in the past i mean we 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 can experience when there's a really beautiful harmony that's that's totally strange or interesting that's it's not um i think it's our brains doing it it's filling in something that's not actually physically sounding in the room but our brains want to hear it in a certain way if that makes sense no absolutely and it it, it makes me think about how you write about hearing music in in, in more than two dimensions right and I've seen several, you know, the shape of the spiral and whatnot, and how the different partials can connect to each other. I, I think this is a concept many people may may not immediately understand. So, could you just mm -hmm. expound upon what you mean by music in multiple dimensions and the shapes that it can create? Yeah, I think this is the biggest thing that I really hope we're able to move towards in musical pedagogy <laughs> with dealing with harmony and specifically rather than learning that, okay, here's contour, here's melody, here's the duration of the piece going this way. And then here's these stacked chords, these harmonies that we're moving through. To me, it doesn't really explain the complexity or the, the depth of, of what's happening when we're hearing tones and interaction. So again, back to Tenney, but the, the term that he coined harmonic space, to me has always implied uh, something much more malleable and something that you can see in space because that's what tones do. They exist in space. And we all know that as musicians, right? Like when you're sounding things together, it's reverberating off. But also just that, I mean, often people will draw things with these lattice, lattice forms or different shapes to suggest something beyond the, the X, Y grid. I think it's just to try to explain harmony really for what it is um, and not just as this sort of flattened perspective as what, what we're taught in music theory. Um, because when you have a two to three, for instance, you have, it's a pure fifth, but two to three, then you have, you combine those together, you get the summation of the fifth partial and you get the fundamental and you get the sixth partial. And then you get all of these, like every three and every two partials are aligning. So that you get all this like, anyway, it's already expanded just from this one dyad, you get a whole multiplicity of sound. So I think, I think there's ways that we can sort of observe harmony on greater depths of degrees than, than just seeing it. Yeah, X, Y, that's all. Right, no, it's a beautiful concept. Um, the, the, the first work of yours I heard was the Viola Toros project. Oh, really? Johnny Chang. Yeah, and um, again, it was, <laughs> I, I, hearing the, the various just layers of sound that, as you said, even the dyad can create really changed my conception of listening. Um, oh. so related to that, I, I learned about your, your rainbow synthesizer <laughs> through that. And I've just been so fascinated with it ever since. C could you just talk to us about that? I just, I wanna hear more about it. 
Yeah, so it's that started with um, a, a project that uh, my partner Brian Eubanks and I were working on where we wanted to first do an installation by we so it's secondary rainbow because the the idea is that <laughs> it's this sort of faint so if, if you were to imagine like the piece of music as the rainbow <laughs> or that's the mm -hmm. thing that's most vibrant <laughs> and then the secondary rainbow is the sort of faint outline that would then appear aside it so that's sort of like the bridge between the music and the atmosphere is sort of the idea yeah when we were first testing things with just it was something else completely, but we were putting out microphones and then just filtering it with different bandpass filters and trying different shapes. And then sort of um, we're discovering things. And then my, the first piece I did was with this uh, point wave, this guitar piece. And that was just literally um, creating a computer code that just went through these four different chords in the cycle. So it would just kind of, uh, and the program would algorithm it. Uh, it would just, just, it would always be slightly different, but basically just cycling through these chords. I realized what was interesting about it was just the, the, the bridge that it would create to what was happening outside versus inside. But I think it's most interesting if you are actually in a room listening to music and you have some connection to the outside. So, because when I've, when I've heard it in more isolated uh, concert halls, for instance, maybe there's a bit more of a disconnect there or it becomes more conceptual. But when you, when you hear it, I mean, often like in the kinds of rooms we're working in or the spaces we're rehearsing in, there's usually some, um, it's usually porous. And so anytime a siren comes by, you hear that kind of contour within it. But I, I think the idea to me is more, how far back can you listen through the sound and, and find the connectivity? And how far back can you pull it into the direct shape of, of the composition and what we're paying attention to in this moment? And I think that's what's interesting to me. And sometimes I feel like it's more successful than others when I'm using the secondary rainbow concept as a sort of atmospheric bridge, if that makes sense. But I think that's ultimately what I, I want with music is just how, how to pull the listener's attention into the composition, into the shape at any given moment. This idea of like how far back can the listener go in, in the sound, right? Not just a single sound, but in the work as a whole. I, I wanted to tie it back into an idea you said earlier about the length of, of the forms you're currently taking, right? 45 plus is a long time, and it's a lot for the listener's memory, right? If yeah. We construct pieces in memory, we inevitably do. Um, and we mm -hmm. construct forms and shapes after the fact. So I'm just yeah. curious how as a composer, you're like, do you mark like at 25 minutes i want this like i want a, you know something like this shape to happen that will change by the time we hit 30 that will change by the time we hit 35 is it that kind of scale or are you really just, like just exploring it on your own as well and we'll f sort of follow your logic or not depending on who we are as a listener yeah i mean i d i guess i don't map things out specifically at times i guess more generically often in my work i, I i'll speak on a generic sense because it's not always this case but Often I've been going back to the long introduction form. I'm really, I've been interested in this sort of long unfurling of something. And I find that there's something that's, I find really interesting that happens when you are slowly introducing something that the harmony expands, expands, expands. I mean, it's a simple form in a way, but I just, I find that there's something interesting that happens that when you, you're, cause you're cycling back. Cause the more expanded out you go, the, then you're returning to certain relationships always, but it's always, um, you're, you're listening to it in a different structure or a different variation because it's been expanded, I guess, basically. It's just, um, and the range has, or has been reorchestrated. So then every time you return to it, you're hearing it in a different way. So I, I, I don't know, I just really like, yeah, experimenting with this, that how, how far does it take to unfold something I mean, usually when I, I'm working on a piece, I sort of lay out the structure very clearly in the form and the, all the tech, I get all the technical stuff ready <laughs> and I have my, um, I know what kind of palette I'm working with harmonically speaking, I, I kind of get everything there. But ultimately then when I, it's time to compose, I'm, I'm trying to be in a more intuitive space with it. So I'm, I'm still working through this structure it's very structural but how i'm moving through it is a bit more 
intuitive usually not every piece and i also i like this interplay too of your perception in time because what you think might be 20 minutes is actually only 10 or maybe it's much longer or yeah and you know with the with memory and the way the way we construct meaning certain intervals melodies sounds accumulate meaning with repetition the past begins to filter into the present and it changes perception right yeah you really the way that your music works and when i when i listen to it is it sort of unlocks that internal time that pays no no mind to chronometric time right like you said 20 minutes could be five depending on how we're perceiving that stretch and then after five minutes and then could come back that feels like it's been an hour and it's gaining a new meaning with that and that whole time structure is all suddenly in flux with that repetition or with that new orchestration something something is, is present there that we know but it's get, accumulated a new meaning. I'm mm -hmm. always so struck by that in your music. To tie this back into my earlier, earlier thought, I think it works so well because of those time structures, right? Because we're given the space of 45, an hour, to really take the time to process that. I presume that's your intention, right? To give us that space and time. I think so. I mean, also just, I find for myself as a listener, and also when I'm, when I'm getting inside maybe new, um, I try to challenge myself every time. At, uh, I mean, depending on the piece, but try to learn about a new relationship or some, or just something that I, I think that over time to maybe that something, maybe at first it, it sounds unfamiliar. I mean, I don't know how harmony is perceived. Maybe it doesn't sound unfamiliar at all. I find that sometimes at the beginning, something might sound a bit strange or you just, or you just signal, okay, that's just microtonal music or something. But then after a while, when it, when you return to it, then you start to hear it. It has a, a new, it sort of defines its shape over time, it kind of carves a space and you start to define what that is more and you identify it as something rather than it being just this sort of like, I don't know, neutral third. Or whatever your brain identifies something as, then you start to identify it differently over time. Yeah. And I, I find this interesting with other people's music too. It's, yeah. As we build a space around it, right, the, like the, the object itself changes in context. And I'm thinking about like Carnatic music, right, where you start with that simple drone in the bottom and the first thing you hear, you have to like, you're, you're automatically trying to process and place it within, whether it's a scale or a pitch set or a pattern. And as the piece unfolds and they add more ornamentation and more structure, you start to begin to process what that first pitch, those first couple sounds were, but you have to yeah. do that. Yeah, and I like it when um, the sort of more intellectual brain and kind of intuitive brain and just the listening brain can sort of intermingle. And there can be moments where you're just not thinking at all. And I like this. I don't know, because I, I think it's hard for us not to think. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't like the term. I, I know my music's often been described as meditative. Mm. I mean, whatever, that's just what it is. You can define whatever meditative is to you. But I think it's more just that I'm interested in these different states that we exist in. Mm -hmm. And that um, I think that all of these states inform us about ourselves and music. And yeah, it's important to have that interplay. You talk a lot about uh, liminal states, right? States in between and how, how your music creates that. Could, could, could you talk to us about that and how, how that informs your work? Yeah, I think it's, well, I, with the, when I was describing the goal with this kind of secondary rainbow <laughs> synthesizer is, okay, what is the edge of the atmosphere within a performance structure that we can still define that as the form or the composition? Like we could describe this little, okay, there's a generator happening or there's some people walking by or there's some noises. Where is that still, we still identify that as part of the shape of the, the composition or where is it separated or, so there's that kind of liminal. And then there's of course the liminal of like what we're identifying within harmony. If it's, if we're identifying something, okay, we're just hearing an interval. Where are we hearing how the intervals are aligning in space or, are we hearing these timbres meeting between different instruments? Are we hearing the articulation changing? Are we, um, I feel like there's so many different liminal aspects in the, the minute details, but then there's also what we were just talking about with over time, the, the liminal states where you, you think, okay, I know where this is going, or I, I identify this piece, or I, I'm becoming familiar with this, but you change the state you're in, I guess. And to accept this change of state, you have to allow your expectations to diminish and accept it. And I, I was reading an interview where you, where you talk about concept of blandness 
And I, I thought I found this extremely enlightening because I had just read um, In Praise of Blindness, Francois Julien, and how you, your work creates that sort of beautiful emptiness in a sort of way where you accept everything that happens and here's it for that. Can you talk about blandness? I'm tired of it being used as a pejorative word. I, I, I'd like to, to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, that was with three bodies moving, right? But right. Yeah, and I had also, that came from also from Julien at that time. Um, well, I think it's just merely the difference between, I guess, identifying what's the difference between blandness and boredom. I think when I was talking, uh, yeah, about that in particular, just that I think it's also the, the manner in which we play together as musicians. I think when we're really trying to be, okay, this is going back to that, 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 that what I was writing about, but when we're trying to be expressive or, we, or when musicians are trying to elevate, okay, here's the melody or here's the noise happening, then this one voice gets pushed in front of the others. But if the group is sort of fused together, I think the, the, the more bland <laughs> in a way that they're approaching the work, then in totality, there's more expression, if this makes sense, because of the intention behind the musicians. I think, that, I think that's what I was trying to talk about, because um, I think often how we're trained to approach, well, especially um, classically speaking, Western classical music, we're taught to, okay, this, this needs, we have to show that this is happening, or this dramaturgical thing. Or, um, but if you just allow the form or the structure to guide you, and you just accept that, as the beautiful thing or you accept that as as being in a state and you're there with some musicians and you just decide okay i'm just going to be in this place together and and then the clearer that we are together sounding these things in interaction if if we sort of not suppress ourselves but if we meet together in a more clear way then we're going to obtain these other expressivities which and that's the thing that I, I, I'm interested in is how do we get to that state? Because I feel like this is the most challenging thing as musicians is how to, I think it's, it's easier as a solo in solo form, but the more people we add to it, the more in a way, the more bland we have to <laughs> be in interaction. <laughs> right. So does your, does your practice as a violist directly inform this? Maybe, maybe it came from... Yeah, just sitting in the center of the, the orchestra. And <laughs> yeah, it could be. Yeah, not having, uh, just being in the middle voice. I've, yeah, I've always enjoyed it. Because also with, I, I find in, in the work I've been most recently doing, I feel like it's most working when melody and harmony are sort of meeting together. There's no, like you don't distinguish one over the other. They're all sort of functioning in the same space. Yeah. Does anyone else have any? Questions for Kat immediately? If I could jump in real quick, um, one of the things that, that got brought up a few different times, especially near the beginning and just now was with the playing with, with other people and you know the different kinds of expressions that you can get from that and, and the importance of musicking together. And um, if I could just tie this into you know the current events with the pandemic and not being able to perform live with each other in, in certain aspects, but as well in kind of what we were talking about a little bit with um, of the social justice protests and how you feel that you know being together as musicians and playing music together can kind of exist in both of these states in a beneficial way i was wondering if you had any thoughts on that yeah i mean here in germany we're starting to sort of people are allowed to start to meet for rehearsing together but yeah i i think the main thing i've been thinking about most recently or i've been thinking about for a while but i think it just seems more important now more than ever but i i want to make this a life term goal maybe it sounds kind of hippie but just how to be together <laughs> and not allow I, mean, I just feel like these kind of hierarchical thinkings exist in so many dimensions of our lives and also inform how we view otherness yeah I, I'm just trying to maybe break apart for myself how to better approach musicking <laughs> Because, I mean, I think also with um, the kind of circles I'm in, I mean, I'm around a lot of Western music practitioners, even though maybe a lot of them are inspired by other cultures. It's like always putting people at an, in an other state. 
And I, I, I just, I hope that this breaks down further or just that the specifically Germanic Western music is not held at the top of some pyramid or something. That it's just one part of a whole history that we have to dissect further. So um, in this ensemble that I'm starting to work on with people here, I think that's also a major goal is how do you have everyone's voice present um, and just giving input to the development of the of the ensemble and, and then also just trying to think outside of what's just thrown at us all the time that this is what is um this is what you should be doing like and just kind of go, look uh, maybe it's another liminal thing just like looking beyond that and thinking oh but yeah i mean arabic people were doing this way before <laughs> i mean i'm just speaking in simple terms but i think it's true it, it, we really have to push beyond what we're comfortable with. <laughs> and the, the pandemic certainly has pushed all of us as musicians beyond our comfort zone, right? You, yeah. Music performance degrees suddenly became music technology degrees. And we're, we're really forced to rethink how and why we do what we do and what it means to music. Oh, how are you doing that right it's now? There's been a lot, of, a lot of these, a lot of like six virtual spaces. Um, and obviously this is one of the examples of learning that collaboration doesn't have to be making music. The, the dialogue about music can be just as important and getting the chance to share thoughts, to hear thoughts, to listen to the way that individuals react, react to and hear noise in our world has changed. I think every, within every interview, we find ourselves thinking about music differently. Uh, and that's been a really important collaboration. And now I'm starting to think of like, what are pieces that we can do that putting them in a, in a virtual medium and a video medium add something to the performance, right? That's something about the, like taking advantage of the electronic space or the virtual space and finding works that allow for a different dimension to be added to the performance. Not just a, I'm taking, you know, a Schubert string quartet and now putting it into Zoom and it's gonna have to do for now, but rather how can I add something to that, to that experience by way of screens, which we're not doing away with anytime soon. That's been our current approach. Mm -hmm. I've got one last question, if it's all right. What are you reading these days? <laughs> ah, I'm reading um, all kinds of different things right now. I'm revisiting some things, um, like uh, Fred Moten's Black and Blur. Uh, this uh, historian, Azule, it's called Reconsidering Colonialism. <laughs> and then also just looking, um, I just got this book on Irv Wilson that just came out recently by Tarumi, forgetting her last name at the moment, this uh, Australian musicologist. And um, I, at the moment, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of all over the place, <laughs> reading between a lot of different things. A lot of, a lot of people I've talked to and then that we've talked to in, in the interview process have said, it's been hard to find like a single work to settle in during quarantine. That, like every book you start and it's like well not quite what I was looking for not really like the, the experience I'm looking for not really the space I want to be in right now it's been like four or five six different books and trying to see which one's going to stick for a long term yeah. so I mean the ha Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition I've, I've come back to that one I mean just somehow yeah finding things that are relevant but mm -hmm. expanded upon yeah or sort of what we're doing right now beyond the echo chamber that we're already hearing right what from what can I learn something yeah. Well, Kat, thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. <laughs> it's been yeah. a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> of course, and thank you for staying up late to chat with us. I appreciate it. Take care, be well. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much. All we'll right. talk to you soon. All right. Thank you for this. Uh, Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Everything But The Kitchen Sink. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to hear more, you can find all the episodes of our summer series on our YouTube channel and our website, alneaensemble.org. Also, be sure to check out our social media profiles for more information and previews of upcoming episodes. Our handle is Alinea Ensemble. Please feel free to share today's episode with anybody you think might like it, and don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or comments. Stay tuned for more episodes of Everything But The Kitchen Sink, released every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And as always, we hope you are all safe and well. See you next time. There is a diagram that I have written in my sketchbooks a lot as sort of, to sort of concretize my intuition by the way of thinking about music and his rhetoric in time.
There, it's a little square with a dot towards one corner and a little arrow going even further into that corner. 